Boris from Chile, who now lives in Belgium, uh, did some important work in the Belgium. What is it? I have to spell it. The, Bel the, the organizer of the PG Belgium meetup. And he also organizes the Dutch meetup. Yeah. Uh, he also organized the, the, the Dutch work group. He's a collaborator there. And also he's a. Okay. Um, so, PGDA Lowland is one of your jobs. And, uh, well, I find you an excellent presenter. I always enjoyed your uh, presentations. So, ladies and gentlemen, give him a big hand. Boris. They put me this microphone like I'm going to be preaching to you, but I do not give me this one so I can move away because otherwise sticking here is kind of odd. It's like I'm kind of uh, presenting some truth or something, but I'm not presenting any truth. I'm going to be talking about PostgreSQL active active. Yes. And uh, I'm, an, as you say, an air guitar player, but I'm also a holistic system software engineer. That means that I like to uh, look at the fundamental interconnectedness of all things to tr solve problems. And one of the things that I like to look at is uh, things like history or psychology or heavy metal sometimes. And uh, the fact that I pick up uh, Sparta is because I got the city wrong, first of all. That's the Acropolis from Athens. And then I learned that they fight a lot between them. They also collaborated, but they, they fight too much. And because I wanted to talk about something different than heavy metal, but the story just carried me away, and then there are some heavy stuff here, especially because of the history. The history is super heavy. Now, in terms of active-active, uh, this is a topic that I really like a lot. Um, I'm an engineer from um, EDB, but a former uh, second quadrant. In second quadrant, there was a BDR, which you probably already know, which means that I've been working with active-active system for seven years in the Postgres world. Before that, I did a PhD so I'm actually Dr. Boris Mejias, but I mean, that's... The, thing, <laughs> the thing is that uh, they told me that you need to mention this because people are going to believe you more if you say that you did a PhD. And I did a research on peer-to-peer -peer system, which is a distributed system where all the nodes are active all the time. So I did study a lot of um, theory and practice and I implemented a system also on peer-to-peer -peer stuff. But many of the ideas are going to be here about what is in core of Postgres, especially in version 16 and 17. What is coming also from some of the extensions, as I mentioned already, BDR or PGD. Uh, and also all the ideas that are actually available for everybody to implement. Also coming from a very book, good book called the Design and Data Intensive Application, which has a lot of good stuff. Uh, so I'm going to explain you when I'm talking about one of the stuff and when I'm talking about the other. Now, let's get back to the picture then. So this, I mean... The ruins are not as nice as the Acropolis. We need to accept that, right? So this doesn't look that good. So that's why I pick up this other picture, which is how the people remember Sparta, yes? And this is one of the things. Everything that we know about Sparta is actually not written by the Spartan. It's written by somebody else. And those people actually exaggerated into the positive view of uh, Sparta or the negative view of Sparta. So that's why all the people that love Sparta, which are called the Laconophiliac, because Sparta is in Laconia, we talk about the Sparta Mirage, and then what I'm going to talk to you today about, it is the Sparta Dual Kinship and the PostgreSQL Active active Mirage. Because people think like, ah, oh, this is going to solve all our problems. So don't exaggerate into the positive side. Don't exaggerate into the negative side of the Active Active. So we're going to do a parallel between the Sparta Mirage and the Active Active Mirage. Right. So. Usually, when you hear people talking about active-active, they ask this question. And I know that many of the consultants will answer to this, how do we deploy active-active in PostgreSQL? They will say, it depends. But for this particular question, a lot of consultants are super aggressive. And they never say it depends. They just say, you don't need active-active. That's the first thing that they tell you. When, when did they unlearn to say it depends? I don't know. So let's get back to it depends. It depends on what. And then you come with the next question because you need to know it's not just it depends and then you go for a coffee and you go away. No, you have to say it depends and then you ask more questions. Why do you need active active? That's one question. Actually, this is not the right question. The question should be is like, what is actually your problem? Yeah. The thing is that people don't come with a problem and then the solution is active active. People come like, I need active active. The Mirage. See, they are obsessed with this stuff. So, any of the two questions will do, depending on who is coming to ask the question. If you ask this, any of the two is going to go. But then people really think that they're going to scale out. 
So they don't even have the problem of vertical scalability yet, but they think that they are going to have this problem, so they feel that they need to scale out. So this is the first reason to use ActiveActive. -Active. The second reason is that they want to have high availability because they think that physical replication with a primary node and multiple standby is not good enough for some reason. Does anybody think that it's not good enough? There you go. <laughs> On what? Okay, questions at the end. We're going to give all the long questions for the end, and the two best questions are going to give a Lego for PG Day Lowlands. So, you see, people just think that they need this high availability. Actually, it's super good when you do it with Active Active. You look at it, and it can do like a switch over in 200 milliseconds. If you blink your eyes, it's 100 milliseconds. So, that's a switch over super fast. So, yeah, it is good, but you need to understand some other stuff to be able to use it. The other one that I like a lot is geo redundancy. So my two favorites are actually these two, geo redundancy and high availability, because this is something that you cannot do with physical replication. You actually can only write in one node. So if your applications are spread in two different places, you, one of them is going to pay the penalty of the latency. So this is why we want to have it. So while I was studying and researching Sparta, I also came across this very nice quote from Michael, Michael Livingstone, who says that if you want to do history, you have to be committed to get it right rather than being right. Yeah, I never found the quote. Actually, uh, I listened to a podcast where Mike Cole said that he said this other stuff. So according to Mike Cole, this is a, they work together. So I believe that it is a good quote anyway, because if you replace history by databases, it's super nice. Or with PostgreSQL or with ActiveActive. So my goal here is to together get it right. So if I make some mistakes here, Correct me, not during the presentation because this is recorded, but afterwards at the coffee break, we have time to talk, okay? Because I'm, I'm really interested in getting it right rather than being right. And this is in general for all computer science or science in general, look. Right, so getting it right rather than being right. So let's start of getting it right. Let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the origin because in the, begin in the beginning, there was nothing. Yes, there was a big explosion, and the thing is that a lot of people started to talk about active, active in Postgres Core when it was possible to set up the origin equal to none when you created a subscription. This is the root thing for avoiding loops in publication and subscription in logical replication. This has to be done in logical replication. So this is the origin. As you can see here, we start creating a subscription from the Europontid, which is one of the two dynasties in Sparta hosting Agis, which is one of the first king for this other dynasty, which is going to be in the database Sparta and the user Sparta, which doesn't even have to be a super user, which is a new thing. And this is the name of the publication, which is the name of the other dynasty or dynasty, depending on where you are. So this is the key stuff. When I look at this and I look at all the presentation of people talking about this, I always like, why? I, what, why is this important? And I needed to study a lot and do a lot of tests and exercises to understand them. So I think that this is going to be useful. So let's say that you have two kings, Leonidas and Leotigidas the second, yes? And they are having conversations, these are the servers, getting information from Gorgo and Sinista. These are two, Sinisca, two uh, remarkable women in Spartan history. So Gorgo was actually a hacker. She received, well, the Spartan received a tablet with wax, and then she had the idea to burn and melt the wax, and then she saw the message and said, oh, this Pers the Persians are coming. So she hacked the message, very literate woman. And then you have uh, Shiniska, which has a very uh, nice record of uh, win winning races in the Olympic Games. They both belong to the Euronipont 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 the other dynasty and the Achia dynasty. And they want to have this uh, table for storing bands. We call it the Mirage schema, bands. And then we have an ID and the name of the band, okay? So you have, for instance, Siniska wants to put two bands, Sacred Gate, and which is a German band that writes a lot about Spartan music, and Crimson Day, which is from Finland. Somebody punished me last uh, presentation because I didn't mention bands from Finland, so I read all your feedback. So Crimson Day has a very nice song about Sparta. So this is going to go into this table, yeah? Now, Borgo is going to put more promotion of uh, Greek metal bands like Einerwich and Macabre Omer. Okay, so they, they all 
songs from uh, Sparta uh, Mirage, okay? So they go there. Until now, we are just talking about local databases, so origin is local. We don't even think about the idea of having an origin, right? It is only when you start getting data from another source, logical replication, that you think about the origin. So Leotigidas II is going to get subscribed to Leonidas, and it's going to start getting data from that one. So now we have the origin. It's not that you're going to have an extra column, but you're going to have a function that if you enable the timestamp for the commits, you're going to be able to see who sent you this data based on the X min. If you saw the presentation of uh, Christophe previously, you will know that the X min is the transaction where the row was written. So I'm just going to put it there. So these two come from Leonidas, right? So now I have four rows there where two of them has the origin none, and the other one has an origin which is different than none. And this is the key to understand why this was the clue to have active active. Yeah. So let's have some historians like Herodotus who started to study a lot about uh, Sparta. And he actually wants to get anything. So send, just send me anything. I don't care about the origin, just send me anything. So he's going to get all the values. All of them are going to be marked as uh, Leotigi, that's the second. Yeah. So he doesn't care. He just gets all the values. But Plutarch, who also wrote about Sparta, he just wants to have the values that are local to Leotigidas, which means that he's not going to get the values of Leonidas. So you see, this is how you prevent the loops. I'm not doing bidirectional replication yet. I'm just doing unidirectional, but you understand the concept of the origin. So actually Plutarch, because he wants to understand from all the kings, he also subscribes to the other publisher and he gets the information like this and he's going to be able to see ah yeah this information comes from Leodigidas the second and this one comes from Leonidas. This is to me when I saw this I say wow now I understand this stuff. So I hope that this is the same thing for you. Now you know why the origin is important. Good. But this is all unidirectional logical replication. We are all here for active active right so let's do active active. That's what is it UDR what? Yes, UDR. Okay, so you have the publication. Now we set the origin none. In the previous slide, I didn't put it because we didn't think about that. And the other one goes in the other direction and this the origin equals none as well. Now, same example. I put sacred gate here and then the other side I'm uh, going to get also sacred gate, but with the Leotigidas the second as the source. Here you have any which we goes to the other side, yeah? So now you can start seeing that each of them is going to have the same data, but with the extra information, but that the origin is different. If the origin would have been any, then this one will come back here, and then we'll have a conflict with this value. This will come back to here, and it's going to have a conflict as well. So it's either, if you have primary key, which is what you need for logical replication, this is going to crash. If you didn't put primary keys, you have an infinite loop. Uh, well, it's not infinite. It, your disk is going to be full first. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. Okay, so uh, then um, more more bands. So what happens if they put them at the same time? Well, it depends on when they're written, they're going to be sent to the other side anyway. So as you can see, here is the magic of logical replication. It's exactly the same data logically, but the order is different on this, but it doesn't matter because what you, are, you care is about the data, right? I put it like this so that you can see that it's logically different in terms of order, right? So. That work, it works nice, but again, that works. But what about conflicts? This is the, one of the key things to understand when you're having two uh, masters. Now we don't call it master, it's a pity because then you can make the joke like master, master. But now it's active, active. Anyway, conflicts between kings of Sparta. This thing happens all the time. I mean, the Maratus had a problem with the Cleomenes. Achelagius with Leotigidas the second again, and then, but you have multiple times in every century they were fighting. Some of them, they were solved by paying the oracle, actually, and corrupt the oracle. So the oracle will say something like, this is an illegitimate god. Imagine, can you imagine that? Just put some money, then it gives you whatever information you want. Super weird, never seen it. <laughs> ah. They still do it. Ah, they still pay my okay, good. So, <laughs> we can have conflicts here. So let's say, that now I'm going to do a transaction. I'm not going to put in style in the, the whole insert into table values. I'm just going to give you the row that I'm going to insert. So I start a transaction there. Uh, Siniska wants to put the band sacred plot because she's also interested now in 
uh, Greek bands, which is also a Greek band, and she said, oh, okay, they are talking about uh, the gates of fire, so they need to talk about 300, the Battle of uh, Thermopylae. Yeah, so I'm going to get back to the 300 later on. But Einer, uh, Fire Wind, they have a song called Ode to Leonidas, and then it's also related to 300. So now you have a conflict because they both are using exactly the same ID. The thing is that at this moment, yeah, there's no remote locking. And this is a good thing because remote locks are really a source of evil. Yeah. In remote uh, applications, you don't want to have remote locking. It's not fault tolerant. It's going to, you're going to feel it. Yeah. So then this one says commit. Yep, so the value goes here. Know that in logical replication, you only send committed data. You don't send data that is not committed. You don't send vacuum. You just send the data that is committed. Very efficient. Now, the other one also commits. So this doesn't have to happen exactly at the same time if you look at the universe uh, point of view. The universe also depends on the speed of light. I mean, you look at me, my light reflects, goes to your eye, the eye goes to the brain. So what happens at the same time is super um, subjective. Yeah, the same thing here. But if it is observable, this is the important thing. And what we observe is that both things were inserted between the same commit. Now, this one gets the value from the other side, and we identify that here there is a conflict. You see, because both of them has the same ID. And then it doesn't work. And the other one gets exactly the same, and it doesn't work. So this is good. the same error that you get, like, when you insert in two concurrent uh, transactions on the same node, and you say, instead with the same key, it's going to tell you duplicate key. This is the same error. But you don't see it because nobody's running that. You're going to see it in the logs of your public subscription stuff. And then it's going to break until you fix it. And fixing this is not obvious. You can advance your LSN. If, if you want, we can do it uh, during the week. Um, I have a demo to show you how to do it. But it's going to break your replication. So conflicts are hard, OK? And there's nothing there, obviously, to do right now unless you write your own procedures. Why this happened? Because the law is super important for the Spartans. They have to obey the law. And in databases, it's exactly the same thing. By the way, I'm going to be talking about history and politics. And I know that the history and the human rights were completely different at those times. So if I say something that you don't agree, uh, I'm happy to discuss that during the break. Okay? Don't want to offend anybody. But here, the law is ACID or ACID for databases. And we want to have consistency. And that's why those uh, stuff fail, because they didn't respect the unicity of the row, of the primary key. And so none of the keys can go beyond the law. In fact, not even in Sparta. So one of the keys was actually was a regent. He um, was, uh, even though he was a very good uh, commander of uh, the battle that then finally defeated the Circes, uh, Empire from Persia, he was removed because he was uh, having some allegations of having collaboration with the Persians and for trying to be a total totalitarian uh, king. So not even those kings were able to be above the law. So your databases also cannot violate acid properties or the schema definition. Super important. So another lesson that we can get from Sparta. So this is because Postgres cares a lot about the integrity of your data. So remember this. You're not going to have this kind of uh, inconsistencies. So let's try to see some ideas of conflict resolution. There are some uh, extensions that already do this. The ideas are there on the academia papers, and it's also in this book, Data Intensive Application. So let's see how would you solve this without breaking the whole stuff. Again, we insert sacred blood at one side. We insert fire wind at the other side. We commit, but now we commit with a timestamp. It doesn't have to be a global clock, all coordinated. We just need to know that this commit happened at timestamp one. And then we put that information on the row, OK? The other thing is also going to happen at time stamp 2, and we get that information. So when we receive this value here, we are going to be able to compare the timestamps. And we see that this one is newer than this one, so we know that we can discard that value. And we put it somewhere so that we can look at it. Yeah, so it's super important that you get access to the data that you discard because if you just throw it away, it's like ignore errors, just continue. Well, you are going to lose data. So in this case, we have it here somewhere. But the other side is also going to receive this two, and then it's going to see that, oh, the remote actually is fresher than this one. So let's get rid of my local value and let's organize stuff. So this is how you can solve the problem without breaking your con connectivity, but you need to take some decisions. And this one is called last update wins. And it's there in the 
papers in academia or articles, blogs. So this is the way of fixing it. Okay, so remember, that's super important, but not just in the context of local nodes, because you also need to respect things like consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, which we are going to discuss later. When you do have a miscommunication between nodes, you need to, to be able to take decisions in one of the sizes. Okay, good. A reminder about what the definition of consistency I'm using because there are multiple ones. Every read receives the most recent write or an error. So the examples that I showed before respect the two things. Yeah. So by that's the law. Yeah. Okay. So this is what we have here. The most recent value is this one. So we get this one. So it's nice. All right. So the other part of the law it is the definition of your uh, schema, the DDLs the data definition language. Let's see what happens. So we have two nodes there again, and now they want to exchange some DDL changes. We want to add another table, which is for songs, which is going to have a foreign key to the band, and it's going to have a title. Yeah, the other one is exactly the same definition. But then uh, Siniska, which is from some years after Gorgo, she knows that it's much better to use text instead of bar card 100. So this is going to create a conflict because it's not exactly the same definition on data types and it's going to generate some issues. Maybe they can type gas very well, but I mean, it is not the same. And instead of doing with the, the, the DMLs where you solve the problem afterwards, in this case, you cannot. You really need to solve the problem before it happens. Yeah, so you have to preempt uh, this error. So let's try to fix it. So let's try to do it with consensus. Aha. First world consensus, where does it come from? Well, the dual kingship in Sparta were not just two kings ruling, there was also the Jerusia, which is kind of a sort of a senate. They also have something extra, the demos and the efforts, but that just add more consensus. So let's keep it simple to two kings and a consensus layer build up with the first two kings, one from each of the dynasties, and the 22 elders, like the elders of the internet. Yeah, that's the Jerusia. So they are actually part of the Gerusia and uh, these two kings. So they have 30 votes and then they can decide in a democratic way what they are going to change in the law. Yeah, so there was some democracy in Sparta as well. There are some discussions there that we can talk on the coffee if you want. So let's add another note, the Gerusia. This one doesn't really have to have all the data, but we need it for consensus, right? Instead of trying to write the DDL, first we are going to try to get a global lock. Both of them are going to try the global log. Only one of them gets it. So this is the first step. Once this one gets the log, then say, okay, now I, I, I can propose a new log, which is propose the table. And because this one has the log, the other one accept the change, and you release the log, and you're ready for the next one. So this is the way of preemptively uh, add some change that might have some conflicts. So we don't want to do post-fix. We want to pre prevent the conflicts of the DLs. Yep, I think it's a very nice idea. Thanks to the Spartans. Can we use the Gerusia for something else? And now I think normally when I talk about active, active, there are like 10 people in the room. I think that because I'm talking about Sparta, there are so many people here because I'm going to be talking about some things that happens between Sparta and Athens. So at a certain moment in the sixth century before Christ, the Spartans went to attack Athens. This building didn't exist at that time because it was built afterwards. But the two kings from Sparta were they're attacking, invading Sparta, and the two of them fall out. Bad idea. Your failure recovery mechanism is not working because the two of them are dead. But they learned the lesson, and since that moment on, they say, we just send one king to battle. Important stuff. Learn from your mistakes. Try to get it right instead of being right. So you have 300. They say, ha, Boris tried to use an old number. He made a mistake. These are Roman numbers. We are in Sparta. Well, let's use an Arabic number then. This is not Greek. Greek numbers are super difficult. So any of the two that I pick is wrong. But everybody can recognize this one as a 300, right? So if you have never heard about the 300, there was uh, an invasion from Persia coming from the north, and then they needed to defend the entire Greek. And then they didn't have time to send a big army, so they just sent 300 um, Spartans plus 7,000 allies. So they were not just 300, right? They just forget about the other one because they were like second-class citizens, yeah? 7,000. But the other were like 200,000. So it's still kind of unfair. And at a certain point, when they were kind of, uh, okay, they, they surrounded us, they're, they're going to kill us all. Then Leonidas says, look, um, 
you probably go home if you want to fight in another battle because this one we are going to lose. So definitely, we're just going to delay the attack of the Persians, which is uh, a still a strategy. Yep. So this is what happened, and this is why the 300 is, is so famous because they. It, this is why so many metal bands actually talk about 300 because in the metal community we see ourselves like we are fighting against the mainstream, which is the major stuff. So they see themselves like, ah, oh, we are the last standing um, bands against the rest of the world. So let, let's get on. You can use it for sequence trench. At a certain moment, when I told you the kings were only one of them going to battle, Leonidas went to fight there in Thermopylae, so he was not much able to talk, have some discussion with Leotichidas or the, the rest of the Herusia. So if he needed to add some information, he needed to have a range where he didn't have to have any discussion with anybody else. He didn't have to synchronize with anybody. So he said, okay, can you give me a sequence before I go to battle so I can take my own decisions? This is super important for geo-redundancy and for high availability and even for scaling out. You need to spread your load so that you can take decisions autonomously and you don't have to coordinate all the time. Coordinating all the time takes a lot of latency. So the other one says, okay, give me a sequence range as well. Okay, well, you can get from one to 100, the other one from 101 to 200. And then they, can know, they know that they can write on those values. Yeah? And afterwards, then they can recite, okay, well, I ran out of uh, sequences, so give me another one. And then only at that point, you need, again, the Hiroshia, and then you can have another consensus. So this is super useful. There are other techniques, like, uh, I think it was invented by Twitter, the Snowflake ID, it's nothing to do with the Snowflake database, where you can have a, a number that depends on three values, timestamp, where you are writing, so your origin, basically, and your local sequence. And this one is completely conflict-free in the remote sense, super cool, but you need a lot of uh, bits, 64 bits. Right, so it's useful. So you can use it, the Gerusia, for both the DDL changes and for getting sequences, which allows you to give more autonomy. That's the important thing here, having autonomy in these kind of difficult situations like going to fight the Persians. So what happened when you don't talk to the other, let's say that there was a, mis um, a problem of communication, you still have a majority of two nodes, and this is important because in the majority, you still can do some DDLs. You can say, okay, I'm going to have a global lock. We are going to get the lock immediately. We apply the same change that we were discussing. The thing that I'm showing you is the same stuff, but with two nodes instead of three. And then when the communication is back, uh, Leonida said, okay, so what's, what's going on? Oh, we got this new table. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Well, he never came back, but uh, if he would have come back, he would have got the table. Yeah. Right. And then you say, why, why, why don't we use then consensus to solve the conflicts that we are writing every value? Well, let's try to do it. So another band, uh, this is a Belgian band, actually, because uh, I live in Belgium now, so you also need to talk about Belgian bands. Well, so I don't need to. I want to talk about Belgian bands, which is a different stuff. So instead of just writing this value, first I'm going to get a global lock. This takes time. Then I get the lock. Then I write the value. Then I put it. Uh, I release the log, and then, oops, so I, I give it to some other nodes. And then in this case, because I have consensus, it's enough for me to write it on the majority, yeah? So this one, it didn't even get the information because he, he was in Thermopylae, yeah? So this is slower, so one problem is already performance, but then it's not just performance, but if you write in the majority, you read from one node or from the majority. From the majority, from the, okay. From both. Well, let's see. You have this value here. Gorgo connects to Leonidas. She, if she asks for only one node, she's not going to get the value. So it's a problem. So if you read from these two, yeah, you get the value. But what if uh, Leonidas had an older value of this one? She doesn't know which one is the oldest one. So it kind of gets complicated. Well, maybe she can get this value from this other two, but how do you know? Maybe from this other two, better from the three. So this already complicates your, your reach. So your reach from the majority as well. So performance-wise, this is not so nice. However, there are some values that you really want to have them available for the majority. So when you write, you know that this is not going to be lost. So you can do it. This is at least my point of view. The majority is asynchronous. The majority synchronizes afterwards in terms of DML. But for some values that you think that, ah, this is the value, then you can use this. And then make sure that uh, your application also knows that. Yep. So you can use it, but be mindful about the consequences. 
It's, I also say this to my kids, like, yeah, you can do it, but be mindful about the consequences. I don't say it in English because I don't speak in English with my kids, but uh, if I would have speak in English with them, I would have said it like that. Now, by the way, um, all the band names are coming from uh, Dr. Jeremy Swiss, who created uh, the Spartan Metal Mirage, and he also writes uh, research for um, metal music inspired by classic uh, history. Yep. Let's get back to the 300. Who watched the movie, by the way? Do you like the, who liked the movie? Well, it's a lot of blood and death. So you see a lot of people like this stuff and they say they don't like heavy metal. Why? I mean, there's a lot of connection between these kind of things. I mean, you secretly like heavy metal. You just don't dare to uh, ad admit it or you haven't listened to enough metal to know. Right. So uh, let's get to disaster recovery because this was actually a loss. Yeah, they, they lost the battle. Terribly bad. So spoiler alert. Oh, they, they all die. Except for one guy. But he died in, a, in, a, in another battle afterwards. But uh, So all of them died. So this has the recovery. Well, uh, Leonidas, when he decided to go to Thermopylae, actually, he did a few things that are not acceptable uh, these days, but they were important for that time. First of all, he needed to pass a message for the rest of the country so that they feel that they are united against a much powerful um, empire who is going to attack them. So he needs to pass a, an important message that is going to give them bravery for the next battle. So he knows he's going to lose this one. So that's why he picked up 300 people, soldiers, that were specifically having a kid. Yeah? Because they would know that he would create Avengers for their, their fathers. Okay? So that's one thing. The other thing, he also paid the Oracle. <laughs> this is, uh, when you start studying stuff, the Oracle made a lot of uh, corruption stuff. So the Oracle said, like, a, if one of the heirs of um, Heracles, which is the demigod that comes from the father of all this uh, dynasty, sacrifices himself, uh, then the Greece is going to be free. They were not talking about only Sparta, they were talking about Greece because they were invading the whole stuff. Yeah. So with this kind of oracle message, uh, which was kind of fabricated, um, he kind of created this, this idea that we have to defend this stuff uh, as, a, as a union. And I will pass to... Um, fame in the rest of the world and people in Belgium are going to make chocolates with my name. It's true. All, all, everything that I say is true. Unless I'm lying. <laughs> so he had a son called uh, Pleistarchus. Okay, good. And this is his uh, physical replica. You see, I changed the arrow. When you, when you are doing, I mean, actually, officially, I'm a solution architect. I do have to, I became an architect just to make drawings. The arrows are important. So you see, this one is a connection. This is a logical replication, but this is a different arrow. It's not exactly the same as that one. And this is a physical replica, yeah? So this is copying exactly the same. And uh, Leotigidas II also has a son called uh, Siniscus or Siniscus. This is his, his nickname, by the way. So this is important because if you are thinking about two different data centers, each of the data centers, although you're having active-active between the nodes, needs to have its own um, replica to be able to uh, recover from this. I gave a presentation like five years ago where I made a mistake that I thought it was super easy to do this. It wasn't possible five years ago because you didn't have um, failover of the replication slot, the logical replication slot. Now that is available. So now you can do this kind of stuff, which is super good because if Leonidas dies, he did. You can replace it by the replica. Now, uh, actually, uh, Siniscus, he didn't uh, went beyond the death. I mean, his father was much longer living than, than he, he died earlier. But he also had another son, which is kind of a, um, a skating replica. Yep. So, what is this guy's name? Archi Archidamus the second was the grandson of Leotigidas the second. So what happened is that he died first, and then this one became the physical replica of that node. So you keep all this kind of technique that you are already using, you can use it here for disaster recovery. This is your disaster recovery plan. Now, uh, when Leonidas died, actually, uh, his son was too young to become king immediately, but he had a nephew, which was a cousin of uh, Pleistarchus, called Pausanias. Remember the one that they win, won a battle, and then the, he was uh, with having some issues? Well, that, this is the guy. He, he did some good stuff and some bad stuff. I mean, like everybody does. So when Leonidas died, 
he took the, he was the regent, the, the regent, yeah. And then when he died, no, when he was put outside of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the power, then this guy was old enough and then he could take over. Yeah, so then when Leotigidas died, Arhidamus II took um, the kingship and the, these two guys were in the same Virusia together. So this is the same technique that you're using, but you can, this is, this is how it happens, by the way, according to historians, yeah? I wasn't there. So it works. Now, as it used to work before, which is a good thing. Thanks to the fact that in Postgres 17, we have the failover slots for logic or application. You could have it before with an extension, but now everything is available. Yep. All right. So I was talking about the battle of Thermopylae, but it's not the, there have been plenty of battles there. So the one that is the most famous one is the one of the 300 of Leonidas where you didn't have any chance of success. It's like, oh, we know that it's going to come Black Friday. Our servers are going to crash. Yeah. But you do your, your, your best and you encourage your team and you say like, if we delay a little bit the downtime, we might be able to recover and then win the Black Friday week. It turns from a week, from a day to a week. And then we are going to win this uh, week of, uh, potential downtime. So you have your, your recovery plan, not just for the servers, but also for your team, for your people. This is how you create a, a support team that is good. So uh, it, it actually, when Le what Leonidas did, it was a moral victory, yeah? And the moral victory lasted for many, many years. Actually, we are talking about this 2,500 years after, yeah? That, that's that's uh, thinking ahead. So that's the one, uh, the Greco-Persian conflict. Uh, this is the Battle of uh, Thermopylae that we all talk about. Then there were the Gallic, the Roman, the Balkan, the Byzantine, the Bulgarian. They were all fighting there in Thermopylae. Why? Because they're all coming from the north and this is the only part where they can pass. So everybody tried to stop the invasion in that place. There are two more remarkable ones. 1821 for the Greek independence, when funnily enough, there were again a similar situation, 48 against 8,000, yeah, from the Ottoman Empire. Now, the leader of this 48, Deikos, he was referring to Leonidas when he was defending. So it's not that Leonidas became famous after the movie, he was famous already before, okay? So people in Greece, <laughs> Greece they, they know about him. And then they say, we are defending uh, Greece in the same place. And even in the World War II, there was a sabotage of uh, the, the Nazis when they, they sabotaged the viaduct that was nearby the Thermopylae. And then they, there was exactly the same thing, delay the attack of the empire. So all of this is just to have your disaster recovery plan, which is not just for your servers, but also for your team. Every time that you pass a difficult deep weekend or a different situation, you have to celebrate that and put it in a wall and then say like, we have survived all this disaster recovery and then your team is going to be more encouraged. Yeah, so it's not just about the machines, it's also about the people. And the same thing with high availability, yeah? It's not just about the servers, it's also about the people. All right, so wrapping up finishing the presentation. What we have talked about, we started with the scale out, high availability and geo-redundancy. We started from here. We realized that the law is super important. You cannot break whatever you're building, you cannot break the asset properties or the uh, other stuff that you need to choose. You have to think about all this stuff. We got some ideas from the Sparta dual kinship, yeah? Like uh, what we were discussing about how to build up the origin none and then one of the values are going to be written in one and then you have the right subscriptions. But even though the kings were not able to uh, go beyond the law, the same thing, your nodes cannot do that. So this is going to break. And to prevent those break, uh, you need to um, always think in terms of what is going to happen if I have this conflict and then how to prevent the conflicts. Yep. So, uh, Think in consistency in this term, every read receives the most recent write or an error. This is a good way, I think, to think about um, uh, consistency. We also review this part that if you want to have a nice consistency model, you can use the commit time of the rows and then compare them. And there are multiple strategies and last update wins is probably one of the most popular ones. And I think it, it works pretty well. To add extra stuff, we also got some ideas from the Jerusalem, which is the consensus layer. Actually, everybody's using now one that is called Raft, right? Before Raft, there was one designed by Leslie Lamport last century called Paxos, because democracy comes from here, from Greece. So it was a fictional um, 
place anyway. Paxos, uh, I mean, the place exists, but the, the, the democracy system, he invented it just to name his stuff. But you see how these kind of things kind of co always come back, ideas from history. So read history, so another advice that I can give you. Because uh, when you read history, you say like, this is a good idea for a metal song. And then you research and it's already somebody made a song about that kind of stuff. Anyway, so having consensus is very useful, especially for DDLs, yeah? You can see that you can have a first get the lock, then one get the lock, replicates you everybody, and then releases the lock and you're, you're ready for the next change. Also for some other stuff that is going to give you autonomy, like sequences, yeah? And the idea here is to reduce the remote locking and be able to perform fault tolerance because consensus gives you these fault tolerance uh, features. All right? Um, if you want to do it with the majority, yeah, like I did here, remember that I got a lock for writing this value here, then it's going to have some consequences about uh, reading stuff. So if you go for that, be mindful about those decisions as well. All right? When you do disaster recovery now, you can mix logical with physical replication, as I show you with the history of the kings. And this is going to, going to allow you to have a very robust system, a robust mechanism to go beyond all these difficult uh, moments in the year where you know that it's going to be something difficult. And this is kind of one example you can take from history. So like, ah, we built up the Spartan uh, disaster recovery model. Yeah? We, maybe we, we, we put a name on that one, yeah? Yeah, the Spartan uh, disaster recovery model. Yes, from Athens. Ah, oh, wrong city. Okay, beware of the mirage of the active-active. If you think that active-active is just going to solve all your problems, the first one, the three ones that we show, it's not as transparent as you expect. It's, you need to really be careful about many, many things. So test your assumptions. If you assume that something is going to happen, test it. Look at what is going on, and then decide whether your hypothesis was correct or not. It, people believe like, ah, oh, science, they test their hypothesis. But when many scientists, they say, okay, let's do this test. Oh, uh, it's broken. Oh, let's do another test. And then they do many tests until they find something that proves the hypothesis. Well, maybe they should have looked at why the test broke. Yep. So test your assumption and be really curious about the output of your testing. Yeah, because your assumption might be wrong. Design your application and your schemas and your uh, architecture thinking about active active already in mind don't think that i have now primary and standbys and tomorrow transparently i'm going to have active active no you need to design the stuff from the beginning and i think that i show you enough uh, ideas about where to look at to starting from that's it thank you very much hey, any questions yes, uh, this person over here please Hi, thank you for a very entertaining talk. Uh, I have a question. Is anyone doing automated uh, consumption of discarded rows? That means last update uh, won, but you have discarded rows. Now just uh, consume them again without any manual intervention and maybe bump sequences. Yeah. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I don't want to do a sales pitch, but I mean, BDR, PGD already does many of this yeah. stuff. There are two other extensions that I'm aware of. One is PGH and uh, the other one is PG Active. The two of them refer to BDR as the source of um, their inspiration. So they say we are based on BDR. So the ideas are coming from other stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you, if you look at those, there are one of them is open source, I think. Um, I need to verify. But yes, there are some extensions PGH. that are doing this automatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Next. Next. Okay, I, I will give you. She was very clear. A Lego, a Lego block. Oh, you were first. Sorry. Um, as as far as I understood, the um, so you presented three problems that's supposed to be addressed by BDR, or let's call it. I mean, while the HA and so on can be solved somehow by the yeah. uh, physical. Um, the scale out of rights, I mean, it cannot be uh, solved by the physical right. And according to your experience as a solution architect, does anyone really rely on this bidirectional replication to scale out rights? Does it really scale rights? Yeah, very good question. So um, in this diagram, you can see that 
the two of them are being the subscriber or the publication of the other. Yeah, so the two of them are already a primary node. In terms of high availability, when I said that you can do a switch over in um, 200 milliseconds, it is because you need to redirect the connection from one node to the other, and you don't need to do any promotion of the other node, and you don't need to do any following of the siblings of the other node, which is all the mechanism that you have to do when you have physical replicas and you have to promote one node and then redirect all the stuff. That's why you can do it so fast, and then you can go back or super fast. So that's one thing in terms of high availability and doing switchover and doing maintenance as well. Because if one node needs to do a vacuum full, for instance, when you run a vacuum full, it's not, as actually that's a bad name. Vacuum full is not vacuum. It's like butterfly. It's not made of butter and it's not a fly. Vacuum full should be called rebuild table. Yeah. So it's going to lock the entire table so you can uh, move to the other one while you're doing the maintenance here and then come back. And all this is for your high availability is helping a lot. Now for the scale out, this is the one that is the most mirage thing because people think, okay, if I can do 2000 transactions with one node, with two I can do 4000. Well, some people think that if you can, well, let me use another example. If a developer can create a software in nine months, nine developers can make the software in one month. No, it's not. So the thing is, you need to have all this coordination. It is going to improve in some cases, but it's not going to be just doubling the stuff because every transaction still has to be written in the other node. Yeah, so all the transactions have to be written as many times as many nodes that you have. Yeah. One way of winning is when you uh, spread out, because you also need to care for conflicts, the responsibility of the nodes. So if one node, for instance, you have two, two active active, one in the Netherlands and the other one in Belgium, yeah, and then uh, if everything happens in one single node, you have a lot of traffic happening in one node. But if you say, okay, all the actions that happen in the Netherlands, we're going to write in the node in the Netherlands and all the others in the one in Belgium, all the synchronization that happens behind the wall can take more time because you don't need the data immediately available. So you, if you have some data that can arrive later when you have moments of workload that are not so heavy, then you're effectively scaling out a little bit. So it, it, those are the things they need to take into account. Treating the load by design and then really taking the two responsibilities of each node apart and then the synchronization can happen. And in that one, it's not going to be double as fast but it is going to be effectively faster. Yeah. Not as fast as one would expect. Yeah. More yeah, questions? yeah, some people really do it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have a question here. Question over there. Oh, have ah, okay. Good. Good. Thank you. First, uh, I have two parts. First, uh, could I please get a Lego Tuplo for my son? <laughs> it's the first question. Yeah. And um, uh, the second question is, that, is there some uh, way that uh, you can uh, set priorities, what you just described, is uh, when um, you want to have this synchronization somehow be lo a lower priority so it wouldn't spike CPU or whatever uh, for your database when you actually need to use that uh, resource for uh, serving requests in that region, right? So, is there a way where uh, this synchronization between yeah. The two databases doesn't um, uh, still make your database overloaded. You mean because they are synchronized and they are yes. extra load, and then yes. you want to have all this as a background? Work. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that Post is going to try to do it as fast as possible because every change that you don't send to the other node, which is what you need to do for the mechanism, is going to accumulate wall in your disk. And if you accumulate too much wall in your disk, this is also going to create other problems. So you want to get rid of the wall as fast as you can. Um, so I don't think that there is a way of uh, slowing down the processes that are sending the stuff. Actually, there is more effort to speed up that when you have parallel apply, which is one of the new things that, because everything is one stream. So every, I mean, not only Gorgo is writing in Leonidas node, it can be multiple nodes, but all of them are going to be in one single stream going to Leotiki, that's the second. But at that point, when you get at the other side, we are trying to even write that even faster with parallel apply, which is going to add load. So all the effort is actually going into getting rid of all the synchronization as soon as possible. Relaying that is, has not been yet uh, an effort. Yeah. Okay. How much time do you have? I don't know what time it is. Uh, do we have time for another question? I don't think so. It says uh, 40, 50. Yeah, 40, 50. So, uh, yeah.
Thank you. Big hand to Boris McVeas. Yeah,